Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are meeting this morning to uh, continue our work on S-15. We heard from uh, uh, half a dozen or more witnesses on the bill last week, um, but we had not yet had the opportunity to dive in deep uh, from the perspective of our uh, elections uh, administrators. So we are joined here today by Director of Elections, Will Senning and Carol Dawes, who is uh, with the uh, Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Association. And um, we expect that this will be a, a fruitful conversation about the various um, aspects of the bill. Lots of folks uh, had questions wanting to understand how uh, how these changes would be implemented on the ground and how they compare to uh, what we did or didn't do in the 2020 uh, universal vote by mail. Um, so welcome to Will Senning and uh, Carol Dawes and Chris Winters. Um, I don't know if the three of you uh, flipped a coin while you were in the waiting room to see who would go first, but I will let you tell me um, who's ready to go. Thank you, Madam Chair. If you don't mind, um, I would quickly uh, kind of kick off this discussion and then uh, turn it over to the real elections experts, Will Senning and Carol Dawes. Um, what, what I thought would be most helpful for the committee based on what uh, we heard from you last week and, and what I saw in your discussion yesterday was to start with an overview of, um, of the Vermont experience in three very interrelated areas of checklist maintenance, the security measures that we do have in place, and a, and a brief discussion also about voter fraud. Um, is, is that acceptable, Madam Chair? That sounds like it touches on some of the issues we had questions around, so thank you. Thank you, and hopefully this will answer some of the questions in advance, but there'll be uh, plenty of opportunity to talk to Director Senning about the questions that you have. Um, I'll also just let the committee know that I sent over uh, a, an overview, a PowerPoint uh, this morning to Andrea, and, and it should be on your committee page. It's a very high level um, uh, bullet points of what we're talking about here today in our, our opening testimony. So with an increase in, in mailed ballots in, in this bill in S-15 comes an increased responsibility to make sure that all of the ad addresses in the voter checklist are up to date and as accurate as possible. And I would just say that due to the strides we've made over the last several years, our voter checklist is the most accurate it has ever been. And it's getting better and more accurate every single day. And Will can talk about some uh, reasons why that is happening. We thought we'd start out uh, today telling you with the steps that we take along with our local state and national partners to make sure that that voter checklist is scoured and updated constantly as people move around or, or pass away. Um, everyone wants as accurate a voter checklist as possible, but we have to recognize that this has to be done with a, a, a balance with voter access because the removal of a voter from the voter checklist has to be done in a really careful and deliberate way. And that's according to state law and federal law and our elections procedures. So I'll turn it over to Will to, to walk through how this maintenance occurs. And it occurs through the use of our town clerks and, and local boards of civil authority. Automatic voter registration has played a big part in making our voter checklist more accurate. Our Vermont election management system flags any moves within state and, and the clerks can talk to each other through VEMS about those moves. Um, we get monthly death, death notices from the Department of Health. We get move notices from other states. We are now a member of the 30 state electronic registration information center, which is going to be a powerful tool in finding uh, voters who are registered in multiple states. Uh, we had our postcard and ballot mailing efforts in 2020 that went a long ways toward election clean, uh, uh, checklist cleanup. And, and we also have big plans for uh, what we're calling our summer of checklist maintenance in 2021 in anticipation of another vote by mail election. So I'll turn it over to Will to walk through a little bit of the detail in each of those areas. Great. Thank you, Chris. Welcome, Will. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Chris. And um, Hi to the committee, good to be back. And um, thank you for your patience with me being away for a little bit last week. Um, I appreciate it, but nice to be back. And Chris gave a nice overview there. Like he said, I'm just gonna go into a, a little more detail um, in terms of our <clears throat> the laws around checklist maintenance and the processes around it here in Vermont. Um, 
And as Chris mentioned at the top, I think it's even more important than ever for us to do everything we can to clean up our checklist as much as possible, have it as up to date as possible, and have the records, even, even when they are qualified registered voters who are here right now, contain all of the information that um, makes it makes it easier to administer the elections. And so we want complete records um, and accurate records. And uh, if we're intending to mail ballots to all voters for the November general elections, all active voters, like the bill contemplates, again, this becomes uh, more important than ever. When people, people have been raising concerns about various means of voter fraud, um, always and even more so since the introduction of the bill. And I think the what seems to be sort of the primary concern that I hear out there is about the possibility of somebody returning ballots that are sent to a voter who's no longer registered or no longer at the address um, that we have on the checklist and the possibility that those ballots could be returned by somebody other than that person. And so what's the, what's the most direct best way to address that particular um, risk of fraud, it's to have an accurate checklist that has as few of those bad addresses as possible. So really this checklist maintenance is um, a primary security measure um, when you're talking about mailing out ballots to all active registered voters. So it's always been an important piece of the clerk's responsibilities and our responsibilities at the state, however, even before and despite whether we decide to mail a ballot to all active voters. Um, checklist maintenance, I always call it one of their primary election related responsibilities for the town clerks and the BCAs. Um, we try to emphasize that at times when there isn't an immediate pending election, when they don't have actual election administration um, work to do, they, their one ongoing throughout the year elections related responsibility is to keep up with the voter checklist. And that means adding names as applications come in, reviewing those applications, making sure they're um, eligible registered voters, and also um, efforts at maintenance at reaching out to voters who um, you think may have moved or passed away. Um, so we highlight checklist maintenance in, in all of the materials that we provide to the clerks for training. Um, our, our primary procedures booklet starts with checklist maintenance as the off-season duty of clerks and BCAs and walks them through the laws and procedures around it. Our trainings start with checklist maintenance as the first thing I talk about during my biannual uh, summer trainings in the summer before the election. Um, and in periodic bulletins that we send to the clerk, clerks, we're constantly reminding them about checklist maintenance. And especially in the off year when they're actually required by state law to do a review person by person of the checklist. And I'll get to that in a second. So the laws around checklist maintenance, it seems when people talk about it these days and um, as the attention on this bill has grown, it's, it's as if it's kind of the wild west out there and it really is. Um, there are specific laws, both at the federal and state level that govern how names are added and removed from the checklist. Um, and again, like I said, procedures in our office that help the clerks take care of that and um, features of our system and other efforts we're taking. Uh, that are all geared toward cleaning up the checklist. So from a legal perspective, um, and, and the, I guess the most common reason that you would want to remove somebody from the checklist is um, because they moved out of town, because they changed their place of residence. That's also sort of the, the reason for removing from someone from the checklist that is um, ripe for the most abuse. Um, Historically, people have been removed from checklists on the assumption that they have moved um, in, in numbers that concerned people in terms of um, voter disenfranchisement. That led to, when the National Voter Registration Act was passed, some provisions in the MVRA that speak to checklist maintenance and particularly removing names from the checklist for um, reasons of, of a change of residence. And I've walked the committee through that law before, but I will really quickly now to, um, for those of you who are new and just to refresh your memory, what the MVRA requires is that in order to, before you may remove somebody for the reason of a change of residence, you have to mail that voter a notice. And it says you mail them a notice at their last known address to the, to the keeper of the checklist. That notice gives the voter an opportunity to say, hey, I still live here and provide either their new address or confirm that they are at the address that you have on the checklist. 
or say, no, you can remove me. Um, if you do not get a response to that notice sent to that voter, when that notice is sent is when they go into the challenged status on our checklist. So any voters that have been sent that notice on the, on the assumption or the notion that they may have moved out of town will be a challenged voter and wouldn't be sent a ballot under the provisions of the bill as it's currently written. Um, if the voter doesn't reply to that notice for a period of uh, two general elections, they can then be removed from the list. So they either reply to that notice, sending it back, contacting the clerks in some other way, giving them a call, sending them an email, or when they arrive to vote, or what if they request an absentee ballot. So if a challenged voter requests an absentee ballot, the clerk, along with the ballot, sends the opportunity to respond to the challenge notice. And so you expect to get back from that voter both a statement that, yes, I'm still a resident here, and here's my voted ballot that I requested from you too. Um, or if they show up at the polls, they're also presented with the affidavit to affirm their residence, which is essentially the same language that is the response to the challenge letter. So essentially, anytime you touch those voters anywhere in person, um, you're going to ask them to respond to that letter and return them to active status. That law applies across the country. It's a federal law. Um, the other provision that's important in the NRA at the federal level is it says that you cannot do any such systematic program to remove voters from your checklist within 90 days of a federal election. And so we always tell the clerks that they, once they're within the 90 day window of one of the federal elections, you can't be doing that kind of name by name review of your checklist. It's to prevent mass removals of voters in the run up to an election in the month before an election. Representative Hooper has a question for you. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> hey, Will. Hope you had a good time. Um, that postcard that we send out, is that something that the post office is empowered to forward or not? If there's a forwarding address on file, if it's entirely designed to get the voters notice to needing to do something. I believe so. Carol, do you know specifically whether those are forwarded or not? I don't think they're unforwardable. They're sent um, first class mail, so they would be forwarded. Yeah, within within the forwarding window. So, okay, thank you. Of course, that you know depends on the voter having provided that forwarding address to the post office. Well, I ask because some of the official mail has that postmaster do not forward stuff on it. So, yep. <laughs> At the state level, if anyone is curious about the state specific rules about removing names from our checklist, it's a single section in the statute. It's Title Seventeen. Section 2150. And I'd encourage anybody on the committee um, that's curious about it to give it a read. It's two or three pages. What it makes clear is that aside from those change of residence removals, which are governed by the National Voter Registration Act, it tells a, a set of other reasons why a clerk or BCA can remove a name from the checklist um, without that notice being provided. Those are really distinct and clear. It's if you get written notice from the voter, if you get notice of death, either official or public notice, so for example, obituaries, obituaries in the newspaper are enough, um, as well as more official notices from the Department of Health. Uh, if you get notice from another clerk in Vermont that the voter has registered there to remove them from, their, to, from your checklist, and then any changes or updates that are generated through the automatic voter registration at the DMV. So other than those reasons, if it's just an, a, a notion that the voter has moved out of town, again, the notice letter has to be sent. That's sort of your ongoing um, individual instances of checklist maintenance and how they're addressed by the clerks. There's also a requirement in the statute that you will see in that same section 2150 that says that every two years in the off year, in an odd numbered year, the BCA gets together and does a name by name review of the checklist. It has to be completed by September 31st of this year. My office typically sends a bulletin describing the law and the process around this time, April or May of the year, reminding the clerks and the BCAs that before September 31st, they need to engage in this process. I think um, one typical method of doing so in the larger towns, the clerk will, for instance, break up the checklist. A to J, K to M, N to S, 
and so forth, and let each member of the BCA review a section of the checklist or multiple sections to arrive at that meeting with voters who they think possibly should be sent a challenge letter. The BCA then sits around the table, shares their common knowledge of the voters in their town and decides collectively whether or not to challenge any particular voter. That's the systematic review that's supposed to happen every two years. And um, the towns each file certification with our office that they've completed that review. Our role at the state level for checklist maintenance is really to provide the guidance to the towns on these various processes and how to use our system. The statewide voter checklist first came to be in around 2006, again, as a result of the Help America Vote Act after the um, 2000 election in Florida. And the first iteration lasted until about 2014, which is when we um, installed our current statewide voter checklist and election management system, which was put in place in 2015. This new system really allows for better tracking um, of voters as they move around the town, the state, excuse me. It will, if a voter registers in one town in Vermont who was previously on another town's checklist, it pulls the voter off of that checklist and notifies the clerk in that town that the voter has been removed from their checklist and provides the opportunity for the clerk to return that voter to their town if that was a mistaken registration, for instance. But the default in the system right now is that if a voter registers in one town who was previously on another town's checklist, they're automatically removed from that checklist. That um, one piece of functionality has really helped to reduce the creation of duplicates in the system. It was a very common problem that's, that a voter would be added in one town and not removed from another town's checklist which I believe created a lot of the legacy duplicates that we still have in the data that are getting cleaned up. Um, we've really reduced the number of new instances of that since 2015. We, as Chris mentioned, um, get notice from other states. If a Vermont voter, um, when they register to vote in another state indicates that they were previously registered in Vermont, almost all voter registration applications around the country ask that question, were you previously registered somewhere else and where? You write the town and city in Vermont. And most of the states I can say are good about providing us notice of those voter registrations. Um, we get a lot from Florida, as you might assume, in Arizona. Um, and my staff on a constant basis will receive those into our office and farm them out to the various clerks around the state. Um, we also do our part, of course, if any voters register in Vermont and indicate that they were previously registered in another state, we have a contact email for a checklist administrator in all 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico. Um, and we send a notice to any of them anytime that, is, that a person indicates that they were previously registered in another state. Um, deaths. On a monthly basis, a member of my staff gets a report from the Department of Health with the deaths that have occurred in Vermont. I touched base with her last week. It's typically around 300 or so. It's probably a, an average. Um, unfortunately and sadly, it's gone up over the past year during COVID. Um, she, for example, will omit any deaths of um, Vermonters who are 15 or younger. There are typically a few of those scattered throughout the monthly reports. And then those are transmitted again through the election management system to the clerk's dashboards. Here are your notices of death from the death, de death excuse me, health department um, to be removed from the checklist. Notices of moves and registrations from other states. I covered that. Um, those are sort of the, the fundamental basic checklist laws and procedures. I'm just going to quickly touch on a few other initiatives that also um, are important to that effort. Number one is automatic voter registration, of course. The primary goal of automatic voter registration at the DMV, which essentially switched the question at the DMV from having to opt in to, to registering to vote to opting out. So it happens unless you say no. Um, it's certainly increased our new registration rate. And that was probably the primary goal, just to get as many eligible Vermonters who were out there who hadn't thought about registering to vote, but do think about renewing their license to be included on the rolls. 
but um, as importantly and almost more importantly to us and the clerks as we've gone along is what it's done in terms of record cleanup, uh, filling out information in existing records. So records that we didn't have a driver's license number or didn't have a birth, date of birth uh, or an accurate address that when a voter updates at the DMV and we get that information, the clerks can fill out that record. I do know and I want to acknowledge the clerks are often frustrated with the quality of data that comes over from the DMV. Um, unfortunately, that's typically, as, as far as we can tell, primarily driven by the customer themselves providing bad data to the DMV or old data to the DMV or bad addresses to the DMV that then just flow through to us. There's also data entry errors though that happen um, with that volume of data. On the whole, it's been a really successful effort in terms of adding voters to the rolls and cleaning up the voter checklist. Okay. That on Representative the Gannon with a question, if I can interrupt you for a moment. Um, actually, I have a couple of questions, Will. Um, sure. Thank you for testifying today. Um, does the Secretary of State's office use the um, United States Post Office National Change of Address System to verify um, change of addresses? Not on a, no, um, Rep. Gannon, not on a regular basis. We, it's something we have um, looked into a number of times. We've worked with a, a, an administer, administrator of that program, and um, a few issues with our data have made it not ideal. Now, having said that, I was going to get to a couple bullets down here are joining the ERIC initiative, and the ERIC initiative will enable us to take advantage of NCOA on a regular basis, as well as a couple other databases. Okay. Um, my second question is, um, 17 VSA section 2154 is the statewide voter checklist law. Um, and, and I'm just looking at it. it it does say ensure the compatibility and comparability of information on the checklist with DM, DMV computer systems, but it doesn't seem to require any other checks. Is that, is, is that correct or? I think that is correct. That's the only one that's explicit in statute. Okay, so your checking with the Department of Health is not required in statute for deaths? I don't believe that's codified anywhere, but let me make sure I have the accurate answer to that question for you. I'll get back if I find language in statute, but I, I think that's administrative procedure at this point. Okay. The, just, just because you mentioned it, we do get the nightly, excuse me, Madam okay. Chair. Yeah, that's okay, go ahead. We get the full nightly customer file from the DMV. So these are not just um, records that are coming over through the AVR process, but in addition to that, in addition to the new registrations and change of addresses, we just get their whole customer file with the um, driver's license numbers. And that's what enables the system to automatically verify driver's license numbers when the clerks enter them for new registrations, which we do do. All right, Representative LeClaire has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Will, how are you? I'm good, morning. I bet you're very happy to be back at work. A um, couple questions about this uh, statewide checklist. Um, number one, in the in the conversation around the curing, what kind of information do the well goes into the statewide checklist from DMV or say from somebody um, goes to the town clerk? In other words, is there any place to get like contact numbers, phone numbers, email addresses? For who to, those are included. Those are um, data that's collected on the registration form, but specifically actually phone number and email address are two of the pieces that are exempt from disclosure. Okay. So uh, I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but in order to have any sort of effective influence on this curing, wouldn't we need that information from voters other than just a mailing address potentially? I think one of the reasons the bill was drafted the way it currently is, is because of the inconsistency of whether we have phone or email for voters in their records. And that's why the default is to send the postcard. Okay. And then I, uh, another question I have is um, on the statewide voter checklist, 
Um, as it's turning out, we're going to end up having different checklists by municipality, depending on, say, for instance, if we, if the um, non-citizen voting goes through, those checklists, the information on those checklists, or the voters on those checklists, that doesn't make the statewide voter checklist, does it? I've been very clear and very strong about the fact that any of those checklists that would contain non-citizens need to be wholly separate and distinct from ours. Okay. Well, we're also going to be discussing an another bill on the floor of the House today about 16-year-olds. Um, would that, that would require its own separate checklist as well, would it not? I would have to see how it's written, but I, I don't think so. I think what again, knowing, knowing not a lot about what's intended by it, that we could create a pending status for 16 year olds in the statewide checklist. And what does that mean, pending? So you'd have their information already to become an active voter at, at, at such time that they're old enough. But then they wouldn't appear on any printed checklists that were used for election administration. But it is my understanding they're only going to be allowed to vote on municipal issues, not statewide. Yes. And to give you an example, um, it's the reverse currently with 17 year olds. The constitutional amendment authorized 17 year olds to vote in the primary if they'll be 18 by the general election. Correct. And so just for instance, what our system can do with those voters so they have to be in there as, as 17 year olds in order to appear on the checklist for the statewide primary. But the system knows and excludes them when it prints a local election checklist Okay, during that same time. So, so we, can, we, last, can, we can have that kind of nuance in the system. So my, my last question would be then, that, so on the statewide voter checklist, is, is there a birth date included on those? Yes. Okay, very good. Thanks. However, Bill. just just so you know, the um, month and day of birth are exempt. So when That's I give good. out the voter file, it just says your year of birth, not your month and day. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Um, as Chris mentioned, and I'll, 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 I'll keep it brief, I know everybody has a lot of questions and we need to get to a lot of other folks. Um, but Chris did mention that just the process we went through in 2020 um, provided a lot of checklists, update and maintenance, the postcard mailing uh, for the primary. Those were forwarded. Those were sent to all um, active and challenged voters. The challenged voters got a, got a different postcard that gave them the opportunity to respond to the challenge again and affirm their residence. So it was like a kind of a second notice to all of the challenged voters uh, last June. Um, and then for the general election, as you know, the ballots were not forwardable. And one of the main pain points for the clerks was the receipt of a ton of undeliverable ballots back to their offices but at the very least, one of the benefits of that in a lot of towns is that those were used as a starting point um, for a discussion about challenging voters whose ballots came back undeliverable. Um, so I think we made a lot of progress in 2020 with records, and we're just going to try and increase that. Chris mentioned that I sort of pitched this to him about a month or so ago. I'd like to really consider this uh, summer, 2021, as the summer of checklist maintenance. I was proud of that and excited by it. I'm an election nerd at this point. Um, but, but to be serious, I want to focus with the clerks. I want to um, send them a number of bulletins over the summer, both re-emphasizing the BCA review that needs to happen by September 31st, the various things they can do along the way to prepare for that, um, tricks and tips to update records that don't contain certain information. Um, we also, I'm going to work in a lot more detail with our election management vendor, system vendor and checklist uh, vendor to provide the clerk's data. For instance, I can start to run reports out of this system that will identify any record that doesn't have a driver's license or any record that doesn't have a birth date. And I want to kind of do an iterative process over this year, providing the clerks with that summary data about their voters and about their checklist to let them take action on and do further cleanup on. Um, 
And probably most importantly, I'd also like to pair it with a social media campaign that Chris and our, our robust social media team can uh, take the lead on to encourage voters to contact their clerks and ask about the data in their record and update it, make sure their mailing, mailing address is okay. And talking about that, hey, Vermonters, um, we're gonna mail a ballot to everybody who's an active registered voter on the checklist in 2022 for the general election. Make sure your address is up to date, make sure your information's up to date in the checklist. Um, but perhaps most importantly, this summer, we're, we're right on the brink a couple weeks away with some final data massaging of really starting to, um, we've been a member for the last year, but have been working on the data exchange, but to start taking advantage of the ERIC group that we've talked about a couple times. This is the Electronic Registration Information Center, of which about 30 states are members at this point. Um, the basics of that program are that the member states supply their DMV files and their voter checklist files. They're anonymized before they go into the ERIC um, group. They're compared. And the states are provided with four basic reports, um, which we will then, we will accept at the state level through the election management system. And again, farm out to the clerks on a town by town basis. Um, the reports, I thought I had them listed, but I'm gonna to have to pull them off the top of my head are, and th these are gonna be critical to further, further maintenance. They are any potential out of state moves. So here's voters on your checklist that we believe have moved out of state. In-state moves, here's voters that are in one town in Vermont that appear to have moved to another town in Vermont. Um, death records, and it'll be a more robust um, set of death information because it's going to utilize the social security inform uh, information, the SSA, so they have access to that database and can do comparisons against that database, and also duplicates. So here are any records in your um, checklist that we believe are duplicates. Those, for instance, the in-state moves and the out-of-state moves, be again, because of the MVRA, are still subject to that law. So what that ERIC data will provide is not, the clerks won't be able to act on that and just remove the name of somebody who is potentially moved out of state, but they will challenge that voter in the normal process and send the challenge letter under the MVRA. Um, States that are members speak really highly of the data that they get back from Eric. The matches are good. It's a very strong algorithm they use. They're not just doing first name, last name, and date of birth. There have been previous efforts at this kind of data sharing between states for election checklists that have not been as robust and resulted in bad data. Um, and the Eric, the Eric group is um, sort of a response to those to do it right. And in addition to their focus on checklist maintenance, just so that you guys know, another report they give us I shouldn't have left out, sort of the other side of their role is, is voter outreach and they'll identify eligible but unregistered Vermonters who we should send an opportunity to register to. Um, that is what I had about checklist maintenance. And I just wanna reiterate that Again, all of that work, both the, the standard work that has been going on for years and the new initiatives that we're going to engage in are a really important security measure to reduce the risk of ballots being returned by, um, from bad addresses or from voters that have moved out of state. And with that, I think I'll pass it back to Chris on that note to talk a little bit more about security, if that's okay. Let me just let Representative Gannon we'll jump in with a question first. Um, so, Will, would you be opposed if we amended um, Section 2154 to add some of these new steps um, that you're undertaking, such as using ERIC? No. In general, sometimes I worry, Rep Gannon, about getting too far into the details of the of administration in the statute, but I also think it's important to um, set standards so that that work continues to be done past the time when I'm here or Secretary Condos is here. And I would just add that we'd want that language to be flexible enough. So, you know, Eric might be the, the great thing right now, but there may be another group that we want to join down the road. There was a previous group called Crosscheck that turned out to be not so good. And so, you know, some states were taking advantage of that and then dropped it. So just some flexibility in the language, but. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
I also would note, Rep Gannon, to keep an eye on, I'm sure you have already, but the provisions that are being proposed in at the federal level in S1 and HR1, because there is there is um, some more prescriptive language about checklist maintenance potentially coming from the federal level. Thank you. If, if there are no other questions, we can move on to um, some of the security measures that we put in place. But before we do, I think Will mentioned it, but I think it's worth repeating that as he discussed uh, the challenge, the challenge process and challenged voters for the November general election, we did not send ballots out to those challenged voters, only those that are in the active status. So some of those uh, registered voters who are of questionable status did not get mailed the ballot. And that's how S-15 is crafted as well. Um, so there's that reduced risk of sending a ballot to someone who's not actually in the state anymore or in the town anymore. Um, so moving on to election security, uh, I did hear a lot of questions about election security and how secure Vermont elections are after our, our first round of testimony. So we thought it would be helpful again to highlight why elections in Vermont are so secure, what steps we've taken to ensure election integrity and why our elections remain secure in 2020, even with record turnout and, and so much of a, a huge increase in, in voting by mail. So I'll, again, Will is gonna walk through just a few of the things that we do to make sure that our elections are protected and are trustworthy, uh, including you know, that primary uh, security measure, measure, which is checklist maintenance, which he already walked through. But then he's gonna talk to you about uh, our secure ballot envelopes which include barcoding, signatures, and certification language, our secure drop boxes for ballot return, the harsh penalties that we have for any offenses against the purity of elections. And uh, we have also our town clerk kind of security force and our local election workers keeping an mm -hmm. eye on things. We have post-election audits, one of which we just completed yesterday. Uh, we had delayed that post-election audit due to COVID, but we uh, ran through that yesterday, and, and, and uh, the results really show that the, uh, that the tabulators that we use can be trusted, that the, the clerks and uh, election workers in our towns are, are doing a, a good and accurate job of re reporting results. Another security measure that we have are the recounts that happen almost every election, where we double check the work of, uh, uh, of various local elections when the race is close. Uh, paper ballots is another big one, a best practice and something that, that Vermont does. So we have that receipt, we have that way to go back and check if anything looks out of order in an election. We have election processes that are, that are built in, that many of which this committee passed into law uh, to ensure transparency, to ensure security and the nonpartisan handling of elections. And the last piece is cybersecurity and our federal partners. And we could spend a whole day talking about that too, but that's just one way that we protect against cyber threats um, and work with other states and work with federal and local law enforcement to protect our elections. So it will, if you wanna uh, step through some of those in a little bit more detail. So before you start, Will, um, I think it would be helpful for me to point out to committee members that you, you may notice that the Secretary of State's office is tracking um, some of the questions that they heard uh, asked when we were reviewing the bill yesterday before lunch. And so if you don't hear your particular uh, question answered uh, explicitly, please feel free to raise a hand and we will, uh, you know, we can ask your particular question in a particular way. I know that um, there were a fair number of spots in the bill when we were walking through it yesterday where people had um, questions and queries. And so, uh, you know, we'll, I'll keep an eye on hands and try to uh, interrupt Director Stenning when I see folks come with questions. So thank you to Secretary of State's staff for, uh, for answering some of the questions that you saw on yesterday's committee conversation. You're welcome. Thanks, Madam Chair. And I'll keep this one brief too, because I it's most important to get to folks' questions and, and answer those for them. Um, as Chris said, I think around security, the checklist maintenance, like I emphasized, is a, is a big first important security measure um, just to make sure that uh, ballots are going to active registered eligible voters at the correct addresses and not anywhere else. Um, that being said, 
even if ballots get sent out to a uh, wrong address or to a voter who has since moved or passed away years ago? What are the controls um, to, to keep somebody from just sending that ballot back, voting it and sending it back? Um, I think most of the committee's aware, but I think it's worth um, stating on the record here some basic, basic measures in Vermont elections that some people don't seem to be aware exist. The number one, and you've heard me say before, is that any particular voter can only return a single ballot. So as ballots come back, either by mail or voted in person in the office during the early voting period, or voters that arrive on election day at the polls, your name is checked off the checklist when your ballot is received back. And once your name has been checked off, another ballot can't come in for you. In addition to that, the, uh, that checklist with all the names checked off of people who have returned ballots is compared at the end of the night to the number, total number of ballots counted by the tabulator or by the folks counting the ballots by hand in hand count towns. And those two numbers need to match. So just at a very basic level, that's what controls against, for instance, ballot box stuffing. I mean, it, it makes me sad the calls that I get um, about concerns about a clerk or, or a local election official stuffing the ballots. Um, you know, they, they're, they're, this, this part of the concern about early processing is our ballots just being put in the box along with the absentees that come back. That kind of thing is controlled by the numbers and you would see right away if there were um, more ballots counted than voters checked off the checklist as having submitted those ballots, just as a baseline. Um, I think probably the most important security measure that keeps folks from committing um, early, early voting voter fraud via returning ballots for other voters by mail are the penalties for doing so um, and the clear language on the election on the certificate envelope, which I think Chris um, sent to Andrea, maybe to put on the committee page or not yet. He's, he's shaking and said, no, we can provide I didn't yet, her. but I, I will send that along now. I've got it here and I've read it to you all before, but before somebody could sign a, one of these certificate envelopes and send a ballot back for another person, they'd have to sign their name under the following language. I swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that I am a legal voter on the voter registration checklist for the town or city of blank, which is typically filled in by the clerk or the voter. And two, I am not registering, requesting a ballot or voting in any other jurisdiction in the United States, except in my jurisdiction in Vermont. In voting, I have marked my ballot in private and have not allowed any person to observe the marking of the ballot, except for those authorized to assist voters under state or federal law. I have not been influenced. My signature and date below indicate when I completed this document. The information on this form is true, accurate, and complete to the best of my knowledge. And I understand that a material misstatement of fact and completion of this document may constitute grounds for conviction of perjury. And then you sign and date it on the bottom. Um, I think Chris has gone through before, I won't take the time to right now, the various um, penalties around um, impersonating a voter or interfering with a voter or intercepting a voter's ballot in the mail that are in statute. And um, I think that that deterrence of just knowing that uh, you could be convicted of perjury um, for sending in any more than your own ballot that was sent to you is a pretty strong deterrent. And at least in my experience over 10 years um, has led to almost no indication of this kind of activity taking place. What would be the, the most, um, what you would expect to happen if this kind of voter fraud were occurring is at least, at least with some frequency that you would have voters showing up to vote at the polls on election day and having their name be checked off the checklist as the clerk having already received a voted ballot for that person during the early voting period. I just have to tell you that I do not hear about that happening from the clerks in the um, aftermath of the elections. When it does, it's typically figured out to be a mistake made, either on the marking of the checklist as the ballots were coming in. Um, but honestly, it, it happens with so little frequency that I can't even think of instances of it. And it, it surprises me, frankly, how little it, it occurs, just even on a mistake basis where somebody sends in an absentee ballot and forgets that they did so, and then, and then arrives at the polls and has to be reminded that they did. 
If you remember, we did have one instance of this um, that was included among the seven um, irregularities that were forwarded by my office to the attorney general's office this year, and it was in Burlington and the, um, the, the, the man was caught. Um, he came in and his name was already checked off as having um, submitted a ballot early by mail and he was demanding to submit one anyway, did so. Um, the clerk contacted me after some investigation, we figured out that it was in fact the same person. Um, turned out that he, the ballot he, that he turned in at the polls was submitted blank, probably in an effort to um, say that he hadn't really submitted a voted ballot, but that's a cast ballot anyway. Um, and the indication that we heard from the attorney general's office was that he was trying to test the system and got caught. Um, Director Sending, I've got a question from Replifaith. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director Sending, for being here. Um, so I have a couple of my questions from a couple days ago and from yesterday. Um, I'm not sure, I don't wanna have them all come out at once, um, but I'm just gonna try to peck away at them as we're going. Um, and number one, the question I keep getting is what happened to that man that was testing the system? So if we, if you, you just list it off, what happens, um, you know, the, the indications of what would happen if you were to do something wrong. So what happened to him, you know, um, cause he did do something with fraudulent intention. I'm not aware, don't have with me right now exactly what the penalty was but we can certainly inquire with the attorney general's office. Thank I don't you. know if it's been assessed um, yet, Rep Lefebvre. They may still be deciding what the appropriate penalty is. I'm not sure what the status is. Okay, thank you. Um, so my next question that I had the other day was, um, and what you've, you've said a way to catch it, but what, so if it doesn't happen is, you know, if someone gets a hold of somebody else's ballot for whatever way they obtain it, um, and votes that ballot, um, the legitimate voter um, doesn't show up, let's say, like, let's say, you know, they didn't attend in voting, they just, they lost interest, they didn't do it. Um, so there's no reliable way to detect the fraud that took place, correct? Like someone casted the ballot, the real person never shows up. So there's no way for you to detect that was a fraudulent ballot casted? No, if it was submitted, as a voter that's currently on the checklist and registered and able to be voted, but the person perjured themselves inside the, the envelope for that person. And there was no other indication otherwise that um, there was any issue with that ballot, it would likely be counted. Okay. And my second question is, is um, if someone submits a ballot and it's not, you know, it's fraudulent, that vote never can be redacted. That's my understanding, correct? So like, let's say that town clerk knew, like she, she had a bad feeling, um, you know, but that vote was casted. And then you guys found out later that that vote didn't count. There's no way for you to redact that vote, correct? So if, even if he had marked up that ballot, there was, there'd be no way for you to take away that. So once a, once a ballot's casted, it is there. So that, that's my understanding. That's right. Um, and then going back to the voter checklist really quick, um, also to clarify. So let's say, um, you know, my neighbor, my neighbor moved and there's a bunch of us on the street and they moved out of state, but they just somehow it got missed from, cause I know that in, in state moving gets detected very fast here. You know, town clerks pick up the phone, call one another, but it's when someone moves out of state, there's sometimes be a, a lag which I would understand. Um, so when someone moves out of state and let's say we, we overlapped and the ballots came out and someone picked up somebody else's ballot and was like, oh, I know how they want to vote and just checked it off, marked it and sent it. Would that then keep the person in the system because they still casted a ballot here? Keep the person in. If they were, um, if they were challenged, then they wouldn't have been yeah, mailed so under the under the so, current law correct, so there th like, these are only going to active voters and they would remain an active voter if they cast a ballot right so let's say because let's say it was right in that window of when the ballots were going to get mailed out and they moved 
and you know they didn't tell anybody they were moving so no one was on alert i mean i guess even if they told the town clerk they were moving they still would have to go through that process because you can't do it just on a um you know a, a pretense that they're going to be moving if um, the voter tells the town so, clerk they're moving they can remove that that voter okay um so let's say they didn't tell the town clerk and they just moved again they didn't tell anybody they needed to get out they got out they got you know, they would have, so that election, they would be counted as voting. And so then they'd have to wait until the next election to be able to challenge them. Or what could they just do it after they realized the person moved? Yes, they can do it anytime. They, okay. they, there's, they wouldn't have Thank to you. wait any longer because of that vote being cast. So it really wouldn't have any effect on the, the status of that voter. Okay, yeah. thank you. And Representative Lefebvre, I would just add, as, as Director Senning pointed out, Vermont has severe criminal penalties for, for impersonating a voter or for voting more than one time. He, uh, I've now sent that certificate envelope to Andrea and hopefully y'all can, can take a look at it. I'm sure it's familiar to you already, but you can review the language that's on it where it's signed under the pains and penalties of perjury that the person submitting it is who they say they are and they haven't voted more than once you know, lucky for us in Vermont, risking potential jail time to try to change an election one vote at a time just isn't something that the majority of people would think is is worth it. So as Will said, we don't get a lot of complaints of that. We don't think it's a, a massive problem in the state of Vermont. We're, we're not aware of it in the many years that we've been doing elections here. We're, we're just not seeing it happen. Thank you. And I'm interested to see um, under that signature for the person that did um, try to test the system, the one that we found, what what they will be, um, what their recourse will be for that. Um, because if there's not many of them, um, you know, it's hard, it's hard, hard to prove. Well, if you do do this, this is what happens. Yeah. Um, so thank you. I will uh, save the time for other people and come back with more questions. Thank you. Rep Vyhovsky. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I have a couple of questions, but I think only one and a half of them is relevant right now. Um, so my understanding is that you don't see people showing up at the polls confused as to why they have a ballot, which we would expect if this was happening in a widespread way. I'm wondering though, my, I also understand that there are some ways of sort of doing some more proactive ballot tracking and if that might be something that we could explore. So it's, um, I think one of them that I know of is called ballot tracks that would actually send me a text message when my ballot was was submitted. And if I didn't submit that ballot, then all of a sudden I'm like, hey, what's going on? Um, and I can sign up for that. I could sign up for that tracking. Is that something that the Secretary of State's office is exploring or looking at as a means of, I think it would A, increase participation and the ability to cure ballots and, and all of that. Um, so I'm wondering if there's any looking into to that type of process. Certainly. And um, Rep Vyhovsky, I, I'm familiar with familiar with ballot tracks also. And I think it's interesting. There's only about two or three, two or three total. So two other vendors that are providing that service right now. It's really sort of um, cutting edge election administration technology. And definitely looking into it. We spoke about it in, on the Senate side some. Um, one of the concerns obviously is with uh, the level of broadband access for Vermonters, and even even before that, just who has cell phones and who doesn't. Um, but the best shouldn't be the enemy of the good, as they say. And you know, if so, we're certainly looking into that kind of tracking technology. Wonderful. And the follow up to that is around the curing language. And I'm wondering, um, knowing that we're not there, we're not at the point where we have that tracking ability or are prepared to enact that. But I'm wondering if the Secretary of State's office would be open to making the curing language a little bit less prescriptive so that if we get to a place, um, the piece that I'm thinking of is adding the ability to sign an affidavit. So if I get a message that's in, in my text message that says, you forgot, you know, you didn't sign this, I could actually say, yup, that's mine, sign the affidavit and send it back. Because right now it reads to me that the only way to cure your ballot is to revote, um, whether it's to be sent a new voting packet or to come in and vote again. And I'm, so I'm wondering if we can make that a little less prescriptive to leave the door open to use technology to both make access better and and increased security. Yes, um, and that's 
spot on. It's something that I had in my mind about the current draft, um, whether it's an amendment right now or at some point in the future, I is going to be up to the committee, but I, um, I think that's a very good suggestion. And it's, um, something again, that when I was looking at the current drafting, I agree. And I think at least, um, as it's currently drafted too, it could be addressed by making sure that the postcard that's sent has the opportunity to sign an affidavit to say, yes, that was in fact my ballot. Just like you said, so that for somebody who may be out of state or even on the other side of the state, you don't have to send a whole new ballot package out to those folks for them to recomplete and sign the certificate. So I, I would support that kind of amendment. Awesome, thank you so much. And I, actually, I wanted to note to Rep. Vihovsky that we do, and I think you're aware, you are aware of this, that, that we have the My Voter page and that it does at least show you those three data points, that your request has been received, that it's been issued to you, so you know when to expect it to, to arrive in the mail, hopefully, and you would then have an idea, for instance, if somebody intercepted it and was going to vote it on your behalf. And then same thing, you know when you put it in the mail. And then the other, the third data point that that page gives you is when it's received back by the clerk. And so again, you, you already have that ability to know, hey, four or five days, I, I still don't see it received by the clerk. Is there something going on here? Um, what the ballot tracks um, technology would give you is even more detail in between, kind of like your UPS tracking where it actually is along the way um, and the ability to get a text. Yeah, I think the thing for me that it sort of proactively does that may, may help answer some of the security concerns is if I had no intention of voting or I did, you know, I didn't put it in the mail and it, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't no, think to go check the My Voter page if I wasn't going to do that. Whereas if I get a text message and I didn't put a ballot in the mail, that's going to alert me to the fact that something funny is going on. So while I love the My Voter page, I love the idea of looking at how we can sort of move to a proactive system that doesn't rely on someone to go and look. Agreed. Awesome, thank you so much. Rep LeClaire, I take it that helps to answer your question. Um, it, it didn't, Madam Chair, but I'm looking at the time and I can wait and ask later. Okay. We do have um, a break scheduled at 10 o'clock, um, and then it would be our intention to come back to this at 1030. Um, uh, we would love to, to be able to continue this conversation with our elections folks at the Secretary of State's office and then also hear from Carol Dawes, um, and then uh, and then we will pivot to the bill language and continue to plow through. Um, it's my intention that we will, um, you know, get to all of the questions that folks posed yesterday. So why don't we take a break right now, and uh, committee will see you back at ten thirty.